I'm Brandon Scroggins, the pastor here at Reformation Baptist Church, and we are so thankful that you've stopped here to check out the content, which is such a central part of the life of our church. We truly believe that there is hope for you right now in Christ. At RBC, we believe that it's vital to worship God, to disciple one another, and to be a witness to the world, to pierce every area of life, every nation and generation with the good news of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We believe that it's essential to teach sound doctrine in the context of our homes through family worship, and then to gather in corporate worship on the Lord's day and as we can throughout the week as well. You see, at the heart of man's need is the exposition of God's holy word, taking one passage and one verse at a time, understanding it the way God intended it, and then applying it to the whole of life. The content here is made available to church members who are providentially hindered from joining us in person at the time, but it's so vital that you stay connected to the life and leadership of the church. But this content is also made available for anyone else outside of our church that would find it helpful. But we want you to know that as glad as we are that you stopped here and are joining us online, I am not yet your pastor and we are not yet your local church. Scripture teaches that it's vital that every person know Christ and then for every believer to be anchored in physical presence into the life of the local church, submitting themselves under the care of faithful, qualified pastors who can shepherd your soul. So I want to encourage you to find and join a local church, if possible, a solid Reformed Baptist church. And if you're not already a part of a faithful, biblical local church, we want to encourage you to come and join us in person as soon as possible. We pray that the content here is a blessing to your soul. The glory be to Christ. God bless you. Well, good morning again to you, church family. I really want to thank Matt and our ladies, Nick, for uh, all of their labors in our music ministry. It takes a lot more time planning and, uh, and effort than you would imagine to begin to integrate instruments, uh, Jim as well, and, uh, and come prepared to lead us in worship. And I'm very, very thankful for them. Look with me in your Bibles at Nehemiah 13. We have been walking through this journey uh, for quite some time now, Ezra and then Haggai. And here we are in Nehemiah. We're in the last lap, and each week the adventure is different. We never really know what is around the next turn, but the text dictates the sermon and what comes up in it. And so we're just captive to God's Word. Whatever is around the corner is where we are, and that's what we'll address, and that's where we'll emphasize. And we will have many journeys from here. We'll begin to work through the Psalms. I have some other things in the Old and New Testaments that I'm already studying and planning. And so I'll share more about that later. But there are still so many treasures left in the book of Nehemiah. And I want to at least begin to scratch the surface. This morning, we come to the house of God in Nehemiah. The house of God now uh, is nothing more than a mere distant memory. And now the people have moved on to other things. Uh, once they shouted, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. But now that song has been drowned out by so many other things, so many other pressing priorities uh, impressing upon their lives. This day of worship, this day of rest in the Lord has now been traded for a day to just do whatever you want to do and continue on with life as usual. Trying to get ahead in your profits and your labors or maybe just taking an additional day to pursue your own personal pleasures. Friends, you know, even in our country, there was a day in which town squares were originally established. And when town squares were originally established, in many contexts, one of the first things to go up in that town square was a local church building. And that building itself was constructed so as to be a tangible, visible reminder of the law of God, the glory of God, the grace of God, the worship of God of God that would go forth from those people into that community. 
And that structure would tower right next or near City Hall and all of the other community establishments. And the place of worship was tended to, and the hearts of God's people were preached to, and they were shepherded with the grace of God. But unfortunately, as we've seen in Europe and now increasingly even in our own country, in many communities, we have ball fields, we have bars, we have abandoned buildings now standing where once church buildings and even cathedrals weren't stood and even towered. We hear things like, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I can worship God on the golf course. I can worship God in the hunting stand all the well. Uh, God, the attitude of the hearts of many is, should be happy with whatever I would choose to bring him and, and receive whatever I would choose to give him because after all, I am under grace. I don't have to give to the local church. I don't have to be accountable and fed and directed and in support and service to a local church. Uh, but ironically, for many professing believers today, on one hand, they would say, I don't have time to serve and support my local church or any local church. But I do seemingly have plenty of time and resources to keep up with all of the other pressing purchases and uses of time in my life. The house of God forsaken. I've often asked the question very provocatively that I would like for you to reconsider again this morning. Would you want to be a part of a church in which everyone else gave and served with the same heart of humble, sacrificial, God-directed, church-edifying generosity that you currently display and exemplify in your own life? Would you be interested in being a part of a church like that? Look with me in your Bible, slipping back, holding your place in Nehemiah. Go with me to Ezra chapter 3. No one particular verse. I want you to just remember how this has unfolded before us over the last couple of years. You remember God's people, particularly the younger generation who had not known the former glory of God's house, come to Ezra 3 and they are exuberant in their praise as the foundation of God's house, the temple, had been laid or rather relayed again, and now great joy goes out as they praise the Lord. And you see that in Ezra 3. And then in Ezra 4, we saw much persecution went forth. For a hundred years, Ezra fast forwards, and we see persecution from the outside uh, working its way externally against God's people. And then we see developing within God's people laxity and apathy and discouragement all from within. They begin to destroy themselves. But look with me in Ezra 6. You'll remember that finally they did finish and they did dedicate that temple, that house of God. And they did it with joy and they did it with great giving of sacrifices and they did it all according to the law of God. We skip ahead to the book of Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, we see a man who's called to rebuild the wall because God's people have been vulnerable. And now that the temple and altar have been established, that wall is to go up to provide security to the people of God. And in 52 days, that temple was completed. If you look with me in Nehemiah chapter 6, and even to the astonishment of God's enemies, it was completed. And they said, even those who hate God, this must be the work of God, because no man could do such a thing as this. In Nehemiah 7, we see the list of returning exiles that are counted. And then we see totaled up all of the people, all of the gifts, all of the resources, and God's people are gladly giving to the Lord. I feel like I've had to re-preach the same sermon at least a dozen times because the same topic and text continue to come up. And so we emphasize what the scriptures emphasize. 
Look with me in Nehemiah chapter 10. This is a pivotal passage upon which the passage before us in chapter 13 lays. In Nehemiah 10, you'll remember that the leaders and the people come together and they covenant under solemn oath, under penalty of a divine curse from heaven, promising to walk together in God's law. And we've seen them covenant. We will not give our daughters to pagans in marriage, nor would we allow our sons to take pagan wives because God desires a godly offspring. And because the very picture of marriage signifies the holy covenant between God and man, anticipating that through Jesus Christ. So we will not pollute what God has made sacred as a picture before the world. And so they covenant together. And they covenant as well to honor the Sabbath. And we'll look at their return to the Sabbath next Lord's Day as they return to that topic. Interestingly, we are starting a new ministry this Wednesday evening. And out of all of the questions that were asked for the first installment of Ask Pastor Brandon, I had two questions about the Sabbath. And so we plan to work through some more details concerning that, Lord willing, this Wednesday evening. But I want you to look at the big point in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38. They solemnly covenant under oath in verse 39 of chapter 10. We will not neglect what, church family? The house of our God. I want you to watch how this unfolds. I want to look through an extended portion that sets up what we're returning to in chapter 10. Look with me at why they come to that conclusion and how. Look with me at Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 32, about the covenant they freely take upon themselves as they're convicted of their sins, as revival breaks out, and they feel compelled to respond in obedience gladly to the Lord. Verse 32 says, We also take on ourselves, we freely obligate ourselves to do this. No one is making us. To give yearly a third part of a shekel for the house, or rather for the service of the house of our God. For the showbread, for the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering. The Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel. And for all the work, there it is again, that phrase, of the house of our God. For the sake of times, fast forward, verse 34, he says that they cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God. According to our father's houses, at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. And so very carefully, they want to worship God according to his word as he is prescribed. Again, they say in verse 35, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God, our God, to the priest who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle. As it is written twice, he mentions, in the law. And the firstborn of our herds and of all of our, of our flocks. And to bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God. The chambers. Put that in your back pocket. And to bring to the Levites. Here it is. The tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes. Can you imagine coming in on Sunday morning and our arms are full of animals and corn and, and plants and, and grain and bread and we're bringing it all forward? What a, what a lively picture that was under the old covenant. He says in verse 39, 
bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers. We see that terminology repeated in chapter 13. He says, where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. And here it is, the bottom line, we will not neglect what? Church family and friends. The house of our God. Because if we neglect the house of God, in essence, what we are doing is neglecting the God of that house. We are neglecting God, and we are resolved not to do that. Look with me in Nehemiah 12. They dedicate the wall. There's resounding praise and joy. You remember these two Thanksgiving choirs that are formed. You remember how they march counterclockwise one and then clockwise the other around the wall. And revival again breaks out, and the compelling desire on the heart of the people in the midst of that revival is that they want to give gladly to the Lord. And so the giving of the people is collected for the temple servants, and the whole point is that they deeply desired for the worship of God to continue and to be central in their lives and to be that which fuels the rest of their lives and their focus in their daily mission and pursuits. And so they rejoice in God, and then Nehemiah 12 says they rejoice over the servants to whom those ties would go who labored in the holy things of God's house. And look with me in Nehemiah 12, verse 44, yet again. On that day, men were appointed over the storerooms. Uh, sometimes we see storerooms, other times we see the chambers, over the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes. To gather into them the portions required by the law for the priest and for the Levites according to the fields of the towns. And how are they giving begrudgingly? Because they have to, berated with head down. Do I have to? No. And Judah rejoiced over the priest and the Levites who ministered. And they perform the service of their God and the service of purification. And in verse 47, we see that all Israel gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, and they set apart that which was for the Levites. And the Levites set apart that which was for the sons of Aaron. Church family and friends, throughout Nehemiah, throughout the Old and New Testament, we see an unmistakable pattern of the people of God gladly giving unto the Lord as a regular requirement, a regular practice in their life, and one that is to be done with great joy. It is so ironic to me that as you study revival in the Scriptures, so often this is fruit of God doing a supernatural work in their hearts. Why would glad giving to the Lord be a supernatural fruit of revival? Because naturally, in and of our state, in Adam, as sinners, we are greedy to the core. And even if we do give in our natural state of sin, it would be for the self-glorification of our own souls. And this is why we want to teach our children and impress on our children, listen, children, as you're young, learn to be glad givers. Because if you don't learn to be generous and to be givers when you're young, it will only get harder as you get older. And so we see in Nehemiah these instincts of preserving the worship of God through their glad giving. In Malachi chapter 1 and in Malachi chapter 3, it's interesting that the people of God are under something of God's discipline, even his curse, if you will. And God says that they have been robbing him. They have been robbing God. 
And he says, you ask, how have we been robbing you? And he says, you have been robbing me by not giving that which was required to be brought into the storeroom. Or they had been giving, but they were giving their leftovers. They were giving second-rate sacrifices rather than their first and their best. Skipping much farther ahead, even to that, we know the Lord would tell them to test him, to see if he'll not bless them otherwise. And then later, in light of the new covenant, Paul would write in Romans 12, not only are we to give out of our, our tangible resources, our money and our wealth, Paul says, if you think that's hard, wait on this one. I want you to put your entire life in the offering plate. If you think it's hard to give your money, I'm asking for more. I want your entire life to be a glad offering to God, to be used however he pleases to his service, and to sacrifice yourself again and again and again to the purposes of God. That's just my introduction. <laughs> we haven't even hit the text yet. The house of God forsaken. Look with me in Nehemiah 13, verses 10 and 11. We see, number one, the priority of worship. The priority of worship. Let these, these words sink into your, your hearing. The house of God forsaken. Number two, we see in verses 11, the second part through verse 13, the provision of worship, the ministry of God prepared. And finally, in verse 14, we see the pursuit of worship, the servant of God remembered. We see the priority of worship, the house of God forsaken, the provision of worship, the ministry of God prepared, and then we see the pursuit of worship, the servant of God remembered. Look with me in verse 10. Let's begin in the first two verses, and let's see where we find ourselves this morning in this narrative. Firstly, the priority of worship, the house of God forsaken, taken right from the text, in verse 10, Nehemiah, writing firsthand from his own personal account, says, I also found that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, and here is that phrase we have already used so many times this morning, why is the house of God, what? Forsaken. Why is it forsaken? It's a rhetorical question. He knows the answer, but he's pressing in the importance of the answer on their lives. It's a sort of Selah moment. A word that we see in the Psalms, which could mean a couple of different things, one of which is, think about this. Let this resound. Stop for just a minute. Consider, why is the house of God forsaken? Have you even thought, has it burdened you lately that the house of God could be forsaken? That you might forsake it? Look with me in ne Nehemiah 13, verse 5. Do you remember that scoundrel in Nehemiah 13, 5, uh, prepared for Tobiah? Hey, you remember the high priest prepared for Tobiah, a large chamber where they had previously put some of the same terminology that we saw in chapter 10, chapter 12, and then in the text before us this morning, where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of, here it is, grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. Do you remember how the high priest of God's house evidently had either cleared out the tithes and offerings and all of the gifts that were given by God's people to furnish the worship of the temple, either cleared them out or they just stopped coming in altogether. And so there's empty warehouses, if you will. So the high priest says, hi, I have a great idea. 
Let's take the bitter enemies of God and let's provide a room, living quarters, right in the midst of the temple, in the chambers, the storehouses, where once and where rightly does now belong the very tithes and offerings of God's people to furnish the worship of God. So where that goes, let's set up shop for the enemies of God. And you remember Nehemiah? He does not take a poll to see what the people would think. This is not a democracy. No one votes. He goes in. We might think like Jesus with a, with a whip. And he drives out Tobiah. He kicks him to the street. He puts his stuff on the curb. And he says, I don't know where you are going to go now, but you cannot stay here. And he drives them out. Because Jesus would say, my house is to be not a den of thieves. My house is to be a house of prayer. This is to be a place of worship. And so interestingly, now we see those chambers, those storehouses. They're seemingly empty again. Crickets are chirping again in these same quarters. So now we see not only did Nehemiah get word that Tobiah wrongly was in the temple, now we see what's not in the temple but should be. From the very beginning of Ezra, the Levites in chapter 1 verse 5 of Ezra rose up to return to the land. In Ezra 2.40, they were counted and they were verified. In Ezra 3, verses 8 through 9, we see those Levites working in the matters of God's house, preparing and sacrificing. And, and in six, uh, Ezra 6, 16, they celebrate the completion of God's house. We saw in Ezra chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, that the Levites would purify themselves and they were working to offer sacrifices alongside the priests. In Ezra 7, 24, the king had offered the Levites to go back again with Ezra in a second return. And the king said this, it'll be a tax-free weekend for all of the Levites and all of the temple servants. No custom, tribute, or toll. And then in chapter 8, Ezra returned. And before he would go back to minister in the holy things of God, he said, we have to have the Levites if we're going to do this God's way. And then in chapter 9, the Levites who had come back were among those who scandalously had broken covenant by refusing to separate from those who were accursed in the land. And in Ezra chapter 10, the Levites were the very ones who had covenanted under oath and resolved to live holy lives and Forsake not God's law. So who are these Levites? We've seen over and over that they're a sort of priestly helper, ministering with the priest among the holy things, helping them, but in a very designated and defined role in temple worship. They descended from the tribe of Levi, one of the 12 patriarchs of Israel, from Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, And they came from that line through the book of Genesis. And the Bible says that they were to have no property of their own. They were to be committed full time to ministering among the holy things of God so that the people would be instructed and so that the sacrifices of God would continue and the people could worship <laughs> An atonement could be provided or at least anticipated. And so they're giving their full-time life to the work of God, and God is providing through His people full-time support for them. We see this in 2 Chronicles 31.4. We see this command in Numbers 18.21. The law of God in Deuteronomy 12, 29 and many other places says, don't neglect the Levite. They are for you to support so that your priority would be worship and everything you do would flow from there. 
Deuteronomy 14, 27, Deuteronomy 18, 1 through 8, don't neglect the Levite. But as we get here in Nehemiah 13, 10, if you'll look with me in your Bible, what is the very thing they have done? Nehemiah received word as he returned back to Jerusalem in verse 6 that the Levites had not been provided for the way the law prescribed. And just as they had promised in Nehemiah 10, 32 through 39 to do. So when God was worshipped with great joy and honor and the people were flourishing, it was a time in which glad giving flowed from the hands and hearts of the people as God had directed. But look with me in your Bibles. When the Levites and he mentions the singers who are preparing and leading in that worship are not provided for, it says the Levites, quote, had fled each to his field. And why did they go back to their fields? The Bible says they would not even own fields, so maybe at this time they did, or they at least had access to them. They flee back to their own fields to provide for themselves and their families, leaving no time for the matters of God. So Nehemiah is hot because this is an outrage. This is a scandal that would make chills go up his spine. So look with me in your Bibles at the response when it says, Nehemiah confronted the officials. And he draws a straight line from giving to the temple servants to directly neglecting God's house. Why is the house of God forsaken? At times, Israel would continue to give. They would continue to tithe. But even when they did give, there would be so many different problems The prophets would call them out because even under their glad giving at times, they would be doing so with a heart to bribe God. As if you can bribe God and twist his arm to get something that you want selfishly in return. Or or they would give to legalistically appease God and to inflate their own sense of self-righteousness. To fulfill their own duty As if to say, you know what, I gave, and because I fulfilled that duty, now I can live however I want. But the problem here is that they are robbing God altogether. Look with me in your Bibles. Turn to Haggai chapter 1. I understand that you will probably have to use the table of contents, but we have walked through this book, and you may remember that the setting is strikingly similar. Haggai chapter 1 picks up the storyline from Ezra chapter 4 and 5. Early in the return, when a lot of pressure and persecution came against God's people, and the people of God got tired, they got discouraged, they began to lose heart. And they gave up the central priority in their lives to go and do other things. They were worn down. And they threw up their hands and they stopped working on the temple and house of God altogether. In in Haggai, rather, chapter 1, God says, listen, have you noticed that you've sown much but harvested little? Noticed. We have grinded our hands to the bone, sowing seed to barely get enough to keep us alive. I think I've noticed, Lord. And God says, you say that you don't have time to rebuild God's house, but it's ironic that you seem to have plenty of time to build your own house. And as you build your own house, literally geographically, you would look over or through your house, and in the background would be God's house, which lies in ruins and in shambles of which you have no time for. And there's never the right time 
And God blows away the fruitfulness of their life because they stop working rightly for God. And therefore, God makes sure that nothing works rightly for them. Did you hear me? Some of you have a hard time with that statement. They stop working rightly in the way that they should for God. And therefore, God made sure that nothing worked rightly for them. And this was a kindness from heaven to show them your priorities are out of order. Don't live this way. You weren't made to live this way. You were living for so much less and you were living in the filth of sin. And so God blows away their fruitfulness in Haggai and the people then hear the word of the prophet. The spirit stirs the people up. And they reorient their priorities to the worship of God so that God is glorified. And in Haggai chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, the prophet says, I will fill this house with my glory. I will fill this house with my glory. And he says, the glory to come will be greater than the former glory. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to fill my house, and I'm going to show my glory through it. And ultimately, God would tear down that house, and Jesus Christ would be the true temple that would be raised back to life again. In the new covenant, he is that temple. And you say, where do we go? Where is this temple? The beauty of the fulfillment of the new covenant is that the Bible says, and we'll see this a little bit later, that we as the spirit-filled people of God are the temple of God. Individually, as a Christian, you are, and then collectively, together, particularly as we gather under the rule of God, we are the new covenant temple, the place of worship, the building that God is laying one brick upon another where he is rightly worshiped and praised and where his his word is echoed, his gospel is proclaimed to the world. So the question for us today, is the house of God forsaken today? Are the people of God gathering on, uh, rather under God's orders, are they doing so regularly and joyfully to worship him, to edify one another, to serve as a witness to the world? Is this the dominating priority in your life? If I were to talk to your children, would they say, Sunday, the Lord's Day, is the best day of the week, and it informs what we do in our family and in our lives every other day of the week? Is this what all of our neighbors do with their lives? Are all of our neighbors giving themselves to the house of God? Is this home base to inform our mission for the rest of the week? Is it a fundamental priority in our lives or is it just a supplemental leisure time? I completely understand. (laughs) But for the most part this morning, for the most part... I am preaching to the choir. I get it. (laughs) It's the next text, so I can't skip it. But at the same time, one of the most dangerous things that I've seen happen in the life of a believer is that they are so committed to the house of God and to his people and their lives ordinarily are prioritized where they need to be by and large. But by show of hands, have you ever in your life missed one Sunday and then another and you realize it is so much easier to miss the third Sunday after you miss the first and second? Anybody willing to be honest? Anybody ever thought this? I don't really feel too well. There's a lot of other things to do. Let's be honest. No one's going to miss me anyway. No one called me when I missed last Sunday. What makes... We think it really matters if we miss this Sunday. I mean, you're not going to go to hell if you miss a Sunday every now and then or one a month or a couple of months. No one really cares if I'm there anyway. 
And before you know it, a train which has been on the track for so long and it's been so steady and so fruitful, just like that. There's not a blowout. It's just a steady ease in another direction. And when you plot the point of the original trajectory and you notice I'm only off by one degree, it's barely enough for me to even notice. Once a year turns into a couple times a year, turns into once a month, turns into every other week. But then you realize over time that when you plot a point and you're only one degree off, you will completely miss the trajectory. And now you are nowhere near even on the path. And I am susceptible to this. And God is worthy of more than this. But the real question that I think we are confronted here this morning that goes so far beyond is the house of God neglected? Are the people in church of God neglected? I believe that the question behind the question in light of the whole of Scripture in the New Covenant is this. Why is Jesus Christ forsaken? Why is Jesus Christ forsaken? Is Jesus Christ forsaken in our lives today? Is Jesus Christ forsaken in Elmore County and in Wetumpka today? Is Jesus Christ forsaken in the United States of America today? Are there areas in our lives where Jesus Christ is forsaken and there is an off-limit sign that says you can go to this point but no farther? Because Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that temple and the one who is worshiped in the midst of it. And it seems like it would be such a scandalous question to ask that the real point would be, why is Jesus Christ forsaken? But he truly was. Because using similar language as he was stapled to a tree, drowning in his own blood, paying the satisfaction of God for guilty sinners like you and me on the cross, what did Jesus cry out? But why have you forsaken me? Jesus Christ felt the forsakenness as he uh, bore the wrath of God that we deserve. He was exiled. He was cut off, excommunicated, if you will so that he would reconcile holy God and sinful man in Jesus Christ through the gospel, so that, as Haggai said, he would fill his house with his glory. And he has, and he will, and you ain't seen nothing yet compared to what he is going to do. But for us, for now, what parts of our lives this morning Boys and girls, men and women, what parts of our lives must Christ be honored yet again in? Or is he working in our hearts to conform us to Christ? Where does he deserve honor in our lives that he once had but yet no more? You see this pattern throughout the Old Testament. And I've shared this often with the Wednesday night crowd, but because I think it's important... You see in the law that you had the morning and the evening sacrifices. And then you had the weekly Sabbath. And then you see throughout the year in Old Testament Israel, there were multiple feasts and festivals where the people would drop all of their work, all of their normal labor and lives, and they would come together and they would remember, they would feast, they would confess, they would lament. They would rejoice. You see, in the Old Testament, there were these rhythms that were a regular part of the lives of God's people daily, weekly, annually. And when Jesus Christ died and rose again and ascended to the Father, what we see is that whereas God rested on the last day, in his original creation, Jesus does a regeneration, a new work, rising from the dead 
on the first day of the week, Sunday, having completed the work of his Father, resting at the Father's right hand. And now we see that we worship together on Sunday, the Lord's Day. We see this pattern in the early church where they're gathering on the first day. And, and this neglect of the house of God business, it's a good reminder for those of us who are in Christ. We need regular godly rhythms in our life. We need in our life as much as possible a daily pattern of family worship where the scriptures are read, where the hymns are sung, and where God is praised and prayed to in your life. In your home, whatever that looks like, as you gather with others every day, friends, you need this rhythm in your life. And then corporate worship as we gather each week, and then, and then the fellowship and ministry with other believers throughout the week as much as we are able. These serve as pillars in our lives that guide the way that we work, that guide the focus of the mission that God has given us, and that keep us on God's track. And if we'll be honest, most of us would probably say, you know what, on many Sundays, if not most, I leave and I'm not sure that I feel too much different, entirely different. I mean, there's those rock star Sundays where the spirit really moves, there's comfort, there's conviction. But most of the time, it's just an ordinary Sunday, one that I'm at times tempted to neglect. But what these habits do, or what happens in these habits, is that we form these habits and patterns in our life, and then these habits and patterns form us. I want you to particularly hear this, young people. The patterns that you form in your life will end up forming you. Much like if you look across a riverbed and you watch the constant stream of water flowing down the river and you see the rocks, what has happened is that unlikely in many cases have those rocks been smoothed and conformed and all of the edgy places worked over. Unlikely has that happened in most cases through some cascade. More often what's happened is that water has continually consistently rubbed over the side of that rock to hit has now become completely conformed to something altogether beautiful and different. And God does this in our life. See, people want flash. They want instant excitement. They want energized enthusiasm. It's almost like the addiction of adrenaline rushes and all the while, God is forming his people and saving his enemies ordinarily through these means of grace in our life. Look with me in your Bibles. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, you want a recipe for how not to neglect the house of God and how to keep your life and family on track? This isn't the whole of your mission. God has given work for you to do in your families and in your workplaces throughout the week, but this is where it starts. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. You are eager for manifestations of the Spirit. Hey, you want to see the Holy Spirit do a massive work in your life? Strive to excel in building up the church. What a great family verse for you. Make it your aim to excel in building up the house of God. 1 Peter 2, 5 says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And he's adding one brick upon another, and he's extending his kingdom to the end of the earth. Do you come with hungry, humble hearts? ready to receive from the Lord each day, ready to bless brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you come prepared each week for what God would serve for you? And after you leave, do you rehearse? Do you review the game film? Do you reconsider and meditate on what has happened here? And then throughout the week, are you seeking to connect the dots to the things that have been said 
sung, preached, and heard to the everyday affairs of your life from a biblical worldview. Speaking of feeling a great house, Luke 14, 23 says, And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. 1 Corinthians 14 pictures it from the opposite angle. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 refers to an unbeliever or an outsider entering the temple or the meeting place of God. And it says he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare, God is really among you. The unbeliever comes in. He senses the presence of God among his people. And he falls on his face, convicted in heart, and he said, God is here. Look with me at number two. We'll move quicker, uh, more quickly. Number two, see the provision of worship, the ministry of God prepared. Look with me in verse 11. Nehemiah says, And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasures over the storehouses. A few more names. <laughs> it's only a few. We're through the genealogies. Thank God. Shelemiah the priest. Zadok the scribe. And Padiah of the Levites. So we see the priest, the scribe, and the Levites. And as their assistant... Hanan, the son of Zakur, son of Madaniah. For they were considered, the ESV says, reliable. Other translations say that the reason why they were appointed is because they were counted faithful. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says that it is required of a steward that he be counted as faithful. And these were those who had a track record of faithfulness and could be counted on when the time came. And you'll see their duty in verse 13. Their duty was to distribute to their brothers. So the Levites have been restored to their place. The collections are being brought back in. Treasures are being appointed who are considered reliable. And God is worshipped as he ought to be. Once again, and the people are pursuing holiness and the people are happy in the Lord. In light of the New Testament, Paul writes in Ephesians 4.11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. This is the goal. Until we attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's tra the trajectory. That's the target we're aiming for. Now, application, direct application, we find in 1 Corinthians 9. If you want to write it down, we find it in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18. And we find it in Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, where the church is the New Testament temple of God. And God has appointed, set apart pastors to minister the word of God, to minister the waters of baptism, to minister to the table, to shepherd the, the people. And it's a demanding full-time work, and the people provide full-time provision because they want to honor the Word of God, and they want it prepared and central, and they want the worship of God to continue the way that God would be pleased with. So this church has been abundantly generous to our family, setting us aside to do this. You say, what, what is this? Is this pastoral ministry, some way to make money or something? Huh. You've been a pastor before. If that's where this was about, I could find something else to do real quick. But it's not. But the people need worship, and the people need to be equipped. 
And we all need to grow to the stature, the fullness of Christ. And so the way that we seek to take care of church leaders demonstrates how highly we hold the ministry of God's word. 2 Corinthians 9 says we are to be cheerful givers, trusting God with the stewardship that he's given to us, trusting that he will care for you. Church family, I bless you and thank you for the way that you have done this so well in our family. We are beyond grateful. Matthew 6, 17 says, if you want to test where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you hear a sermon about money and you begin to get uncomfortable, you have to begin to wonder why you're squeezing a little, why you're getting uncomfortable when the scriptures speak so clearly to this. Could it be that our hearts are somewhere else than they ought to be? We make excuses and justify those in every different way. But we miss such a blessing. This is the big part. Because Paul quoting Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. How many of you will give personal testimony that it has been more blessed in my life to give than it has been to receive? Now, some of you have a hard time receiving. Some of you love to give, but you don't like to receive. And you need to, you need to check that too. But what a blessing it is when it's done with an attitude and a heart of faith to please God. Jesus said, listen, don't make a big hoorah about your giving. Don't announce it to the world. Hey, look, look how much I'm giving. And for the God-fearing Christian, that's so uncomfortable anyway, isn't it? Most of the time when people in our church give, they're like, you're under sworn oath. Don't tell anyone, please. I'm like, oh, (laughs) jeez. It's a heart. For an audience of one. And not giving to merit salvation, not giving to bribe God, and not giving because we think that God will save us as a result, but giving because we are saved and we want to we please Him in every way. And ultimately, 2 Corinthians 8 9 tells us, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. Jesus Christ, the riches of all eternity, became poor for our sake, the Bible says, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Might become rich. Heirs of eternal life. The riches of the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Have your priority there, and all these things will be given to you as the Lord finds need. We end with a prayer, number three. Number three, finally, the pursuit of worship, the servant of God remembered. Look with me in verse 14 as we bring this train to the station, and I want you to see how oddly, maybe unexpectedly, Nehemiah closes this section. Turning his attention to the Lord in verse 14, he says, Remember me, O my God, concerning this. Any of you by show of hands have a hard time praying for yourself? Should we pray for ourselves? Remember me, O God, concerning this. Look at what he says. And do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done. Here it is again. For the house of my God and for his service. What an interesting prayer. Lord, don't forget all the wonderful things I've done. (laughs) Lord, you've seen everything I've done for the stubborn, wicked people. God, don't forget all the good I've done. It doesn't quite hit the ear right, does it? What's going on here? Get up in front of the church. Lord, Once you remember me. (laughs) In Nehemiah 1.8, he says, remember the Lord. What you told Moses, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you. But if you're faithful, I'll gather you together. Remember Nehemiah 4.14, he says, don't fear. Fight for your families. Remember the Lord. He is great and awesome over all things. Nehemiah 5.19, Nehemiah prays after this internal strife among God's people, and he says, Lord, remember for my good all that I have done for this people. Same prayer. 
Nehemiah 6.14, he prays after God's enemies attack, and he says, Lord, remember these men and women what they do. Nehemiah 13, verse 14, remember me and my work as I seek to restore the priority of worship. Look down with me in Nehemiah 13, verse 22, at the running theme, remember this, O Lord, that I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and to serve. He says, spare me, Lord. And again in verse 29, remember them, Lord. Remember them who desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priests and Levites. And then the last verse of this book in verse 31, having provided for the worship of God to continue, Nehemiah closes, and again he says, remember me for good. Is this a self-centered prayer? Is this appropriate for the believer? Why does he pray this? Nehemiah is a man of prayer from beginning to end. We've seen very long prayers and we've seen very short prayers. We've seen private prayers and we've seen public prayers. And in this prayer, he asked God to remember him for restoring the service of the temple. And then he asked God not to wipe out his good deeds. He prays this because he has forsaken all of the fear of man. He is not out for man-pleasing. Nehemiah clearly desires to please God. And in this personal, private prayer, he is aiming all of his efforts by faith to the Lord. Nehemiah is expressing a desire to be counted as a faithful servant before God. Nehemiah, in this prayer, is committing his work to God and to His glory. And Nehemiah is, des is desiring not the reward of this world, but the reward of God's Word. Friends, what believer, what God-fearing believer has not and does not envision one day, however God chooses, that if Jesus doesn't return first, you will hang up your cleats, you will put aside your jacket, and one day, and it could be today or it could be many years from now, what believer does not desire to hear before his Lord, Savior, friend, and Master, well done, good and faithful servant? How many of you desire that in your life? that God would be pleased by the work that you have done, not to be saved, but because you are saved, living by faith to His glory. And might I remind you something, dear friends? If God may say, well done, good and faithful servant, logic would clearly tell us that first you would have to do well. <laughs> Do well. <laughs> and in Jesus Christ, he has done all of the work. I completely agree. And we are freely forgiven in him, covered in the beloved. And then Ephesians 2.10 says that he has prepared in advance works for us to walk in for the glory of his holy name. He has a work for you. And listen to what Proverbs chapter 10 verse 7 says. The memory of the righteous is a blessing. When I do funerals, I can tell within five minutes how the person lived their entire life. All I need is five minutes with the family. Oh, what a blessing. Oh, God used them in my life. Man, when they were there, it's going to be different without them. But Proverbs 10, 7 says, the name of the wicked will rot. They may get all of their fanfare in this life, but when it's done, you can write their name right where they built their house in the sand. But the names of the righteous will be engraven in, a, in rock, right as they build their house, right included in the eternal temple of God, and the memory of God's children will be a blessing forever. 
So can a believer do good deeds? Can he pray a prayer like this? Ever so imperfectly, our confession says that believers are called to good works as the fruit of salvation and through faith in Jesus Christ as imperfect and even sinful as they may be in places and in parts. God accepts those in Jesus Christ ever so imperfectly and weak as they are. My children, especially as they were younger, and it'll be coming again, Lord willing. Draw pictures. Here's another picture. I can't even tell the color of the refrigerator at this point because the entire thing is covered in pictures. What, like start putting the pictures on the ceiling now? Dad, I drew this for you. What do you think? I'm going to be honest with you. The children come down to me on Sunday after church. What do you think, Pastor Brandon? It's the worst picture I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm better looking than that. You don't even know how to draw. I could draw a stick man better than that. It's terrible. Like, who uses green for a head? And the body is so disproportioned and the... It's a train wreck. Like, it's not a Picasso. Let's just be honest. It's horrible. It wouldn't even make it into the most basic art competition. Kids are like, Pastor Brandon, it's you. Like, I can't change the way you look. (laughs) Nose really is that big and crooked. What dad does that? Rips it into a thousand pieces, throws it on the floor and tramples through it. Terrible, son. Come back to me when you've taken an art class or two. (laughs) Know what you do for your children. Grandchildren and the children of this church. As you say, that is the best picture I've ever seen in my life. And what God does through and in his son, Jesus Christ, for those who have repented and believed the gospel and seek to live in communion with him and are seeking to live in a way that would please and honor him by faith, but fumbling all the way to heaven is God looks at those good works and he says as feeble and weak and stained with sin as they are, they are warmly and richly welcomed in the beloved. And God is sanctifying and conforming to present us as perfect in Jesus Christ. Come to the master. Be useful in his service. Present yourself to him, dear friends, as a living sacrifice. And if you are not in Jesus Christ, you can work all day long to your hands are full of calluses and your heart is weary in every way and you'll still go to hell when you die. If you are not in Christ, the only work for you is to trust in the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf, submitting yourself to him, being freely forgiven in his son alone. And if you are in Christ, don't neglect the house and work of God. Come to the master. Be useful vessels in his service. Gladly give unto him who so freely gave and continues to give unto you. Father, thank you for the gift of your dear son, for the work of our triune God, for the blessing of heaven and daily breath and air and food and friendships and ultimately in the gift of salvation and and marching orders here and eternal life forever. We bless your holy name. We ask for your forgiveness of our sin, and we repent, and we resolve to walk in your ways. God, help us. God, we pray and ask you, cleanse our hearts, free our motives from any form of selfishness, make us pure, and Lord, we pray. Remember us for your good, for your glory, and use us until you return. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, we live in a day of great spiritual need. And for many of us, including myself, we need all of the help we can get. 
I'm Brandon Scroggins, pastor here at Reformation Baptist Church, and I want to briefly mention some resources that we have available that will complement our weekly gatherings on Sundays and Wednesdays and possibly be a blessing for you. I want to just run through these quickly so that you're aware. We have a YouTube and a Facebook page. We have a Facebook page for our members only to post prayer requests and other confidential private information, but we also have a Facebook page for the public where we post verses, we post sermons, and all sorts of helpful resources. We also have a YouTube channel. You can check out all of our previous messages on there and all sorts of series that you'll see that we've done, topics that we've addressed. We have a website where you can check out many resources as well, divided by tabs. It's broken down by sermon series we've had, doctrines we hold, and I hope that's a help to you. We have a podcast. If you'll look us up, Reformation Baptist Church, Wetumpka, Alabama, and you can find all of our sermons in series as well on the podcast app if that's more helpful for you. Each month also, we have a family worship guide. We have a hymn, creed, and verse of the month, and then we are compiling those into a guide, somewhat like our Sunday morning worship guide, so that you can then take that information, the hymn, creed, and verse, and then you'll have that all month long in a tangible guide to take home and use and just pull right out as you seek to study and pray and lead your family at home. We have our worship guides that we have provided every Sunday that we use in our Sunday liturgy. I want to encourage you to take those home and use those during the week. That can help you in your personal devotion. You can use the scriptures and songs in your family devotion. We are also on the the Bible app. Toward the end of the week, you can find an outline of the service, announcements, links to other things that are going on in the life of the church to sign up for. Uh, You'll find a sermon outline and other resources on the Bible app. We have weekly emails and Facebook posts. Uh, that I send out emails to members, Facebook posts, uh, on our public page as well. And these will help to prepare for the service, to have links to the songs that you can check out that we'll be singing to fill your home, your car with during the week so that you'll have an outline of the sermon so that you can come prepared in heart to worship God. We also have a prayer and discussion guide on Wednesday evenings that will list prayer requests, specific uh, things that we're praying through, discussion questions based on the lesson, notes based on the teaching, and you can freely take those home and use those to further study as well. Every other month, we have hymn sings on Wednesday night. This is such a delight as we take the whole evening, 6.30 to 7.30, and we just sing to the Lord together. We fill this place with the singing of God. We enjoy a dessert fellowship afterwards. And then we're revisiting our previous hymns of the month. We're preparing for hymns that we'll be singing in the coming weeks so that they're fresh on our minds. And we're singing classic hymns of the faith to be passed down. We also have an RBC bookstall at the back of our building, our sanctuary. Those are free to take as long as you commit to reading them soon. And there's a wide variety of works, many Puritan works, reformed authors, and respected resources that will be a help and blessing to you. And finally, we have our Hymn, Creed, and Verse of the Month video, which we post every month, where I spend 10 to 15 minutes breaking down a background of the hymn that we'll be singing as I'll share the verse that we'll be memorizing, and then as I explain the creed or the catechism that we'll be using. That way, as we use these resources, we have a stock of information to help us understand and hopefully light our affections all the more as we use them. There's more resources, but this is a treasure chest of some that I want to mention, and I hope that these are a blessing to you as we seek to continue in our mission of worshiping God, discipling one another, and being a witness to the world. God bless you.